but anyway, so if you wouldn't mind, let's just start by uh, tell me uh, your, your full name and um, where you're from and uh, just a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, David Long, middle name is Charles, uh, grew up in central Illinois, uh, went to college for a couple of years. Uh, well, I grew up in uh, Bloomington, Illinois, which is as close to normal as you can get if you're familiar with the Twin Cities there. Bloomington and Normal. Mm. Um, went to both universities, Illinois Wesleyan and Illinois State. I dropped out of Wesleyan after two years, giving up a free ride track scholarship uh, to join the Marine Corps. And went to basic training, at advanced infantry training came out of AIT with orders to Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. Uh, those are the guys that you see holding the umbrella over Obama. Um, they're the, the drill team. They're also the guards at the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not really why I joined the Marine Corps. I asked for orders to Vietnam and they were happy enough to oblige. So I went to Vietnam. Um, did 22 months in country, came back, um, got assigned, well, I was assigned to embassy duty uh, coming back from Nam. However, I mistakenly thought I wanted to get married, which eliminated me going overseas as an E-5 sergeant. So I was stationed in Columbus, Ohio, uh, training weekend warriors, Marine Corps reservists, and um, making casualty calls on people that were wounded or uh, killed on, on their families. And then uh, if they were buried in central Ohio, attending their funerals, and doing the honor guard, uh, dress blues, folding the flag. Uh, and then I got out into civilian life. All right, so um, <clears throat> did you, were you drafted in the Marine Corps or did you just? No, um, very few people are ever drafted in the Marine Corps, it's a voluntary organization. So I volunteered, I went down to the recruiter and sign the papers. I was one of the old guys. I was in my 20s when I enlisted. And um, most of the guys that I served with were 17, 18. The, um, became really good friends with the recruiter and the recruiter's sister. Um, so that was interesting times. Um, she wrote letters to me for a long time after I went to Nam and uh, till there's one that said, Dear Dave, uh, you've been away a long time and I've started seeing, hey, you know how that goes. Well, you probably don't know how that goes, but a lot of guys got those letters. Mm -hmm. Dear John Litter. Yeah. Found Jody. <laughs> um, so what made you decide to join the Marine Corps? You're going to school and you just... Yeah, I had a good life. Um, well, <clears throat> for me, if you're going going to enlist, you want to enlist with the best, and in my opinion, Marine Corps always has been the best. Uh, so, and I had a uh, high school classmate that uh, had joined. Uh, he unfortunately was killed over there uh, before I got, went over. But, uh, you know, I just always prided myself on working as hard as I can through school. Uh, when I decided uh, that it was time to uh, join the fight, I just wanted the Marines. I mean, wh um, why didn't you, why, how come you didn't want to finish school first or go ROTC or something so like that? To go to the offer, OCS. Um, it was just... Uh, time I didn't want to wait uh, I thought it was my duty at the time to uh, to enlist 
go to Vietnam. And I think maybe it's some of the same that guys felt back in World War II that uh, you know broke out. They wanted to serve mm -hmm. their country, and that was um, how I felt and would still feel. You know, they ought to put the old guys back in. <laughs> We're up all night anyway. <laughs> the I think they they tried a couple times there when the, they had um after after uh, Iraq kicked off this last time they had a couple of guys that never properly resigned their commission and there were some 60 70 year olds getting calls to show up for duty. Yeah. Yeah. You were had a, a duty assignment, a normal duty assignment before you got sent over to Vietnam. I would have, but you I would have. Yeah, uh, and I it, well, it was kind of abnormal. You, very few uh, Marines are picked to go to the Marine barracks mm -hmm. uh, to serve in that capacity. But again, that's not why I joined the Marine Corps. I, you know, I, I didn't want to. So you ended up not having to go there. I did not go there. Ah. I, they changed my orders midway after I requested mm -hmm. Vietnam. Um, they didn't let me go home first, uh, so I spent a couple of weeks at home before going over. So uh, you said 22 months. Is that two tours? Uh, it was almost two tours, yeah. A Marine Corps tour is 13 months, and I extended, and I was I wanted to extend again, but was talked out of it by... Uh, our, the company sergeant major. Mm -hmm. You know, there's other things that you can do besides slogging through the bush. Hmm. So, uh, where, where in Vietnam were you? Well, probably a lot of different places over that over that period of time. Well, the Marine Corps, uh, Vietnam was broken up into four sections. Um, the, the closest to the DMZ was called I Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I spent my entire time. Uh, we were right on the, uh, the DMZ. So if you've looked at any maps of Vietnam, there's Quezon, Contien, uh, Jilin, which runs right, I mean, they sit right at the edge of the DMZ. Mm -hmm. So I was from Quezon all the way over to the South China Sea was our area of operations. And I'm assuming since you were picked for the uh, the honor guard, you're infantry? I was. Mm -hmm. I was actually a forward observer. Okay. Uh, I called in uh, mortars and artillery. Um, and I brought some maps. If you're, some maps? Yeah. All right. That I brought back from Nile. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so did you pretty much... Uh, Calling artillery your entire time there? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was my that was my job. Well, not I take that back. I spent two weeks as I was, <clears throat> like I said, a couple years um, in college, so I could read and type and chew bubble gum at the same time. So I got to Nam, and they wanted to make me a company clerk. And once again, and I didn't join the Marine Corps to be a company clerk and eat hot chow and watch movies every night. Um, so I requested go to the field. And after uh, talking to the staff sergeant, who said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to do this, which is a forward observer. So I got to do that. Um, and it was interesting times if you uh, believe in the Chinese curse. May you hmm. live in interesting times. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, what I did. Mm -hmm. And the, had the, um, you had the maps, you had a radio operator, you went out with the, the platoon. I was assigned to, and the company, I was assigned to India Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines. And um, there were there was one forward observer for platoon, um, and there were four platoons, K L, I K L and M. 
So one of our guys got the uh, was awarded the Medal of Honor. Oh wow! In Indy Company, a uh, little kid from Pittsburgh, uh, Billy Prom. Mm -hmm. uh, knew him. I mean, we were in the same firefight. And then one of the corpsmen uh, who, who was with Mike Company uh, lives here in Kansas City area. Uh, was also awarded the Medal of Honor. Oh, really? Yeah. What's his name? Uh, Don Bellard, B-A-L-L-A-R-D. Mm -hmm. So he'd be a good guy to chat with. Yeah. I think I may have met him at um, an event. So, yeah, he uh, was helping uh, a wounded guy trying to get him pulled back to safety when uh, mm -hmm. one of the enemy popped up and threw a grenade and Don jumped on it um, and it was a dud. Oh. <laughs> so he, he got the, the guy back to safety and uh, treated the other, other wounded Marines. Uh, Navy corpsmen are just Marines in the wrong uniform as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we were kind of in that same firefight that was uh, that was a big deal back in 68. Mm -hmm. So you were in theater um, 67 uh, to 69? Uh, I was there June of 67, came home April of 69 with time off for good behavior mm -hmm. uh, for a 30-day R&R. I came home. What were your uh, living conditions like over there? If we were going to be in a base camp uh, for a while, uh, the Seabees would usually come in, uh, clear the area of foliage, uh, knock down trees, give us fields of fire, um, dig holes in the ground, uh, and then leave the sand for us to fill the sandbags. And um, sometimes they would bring in uh, reinforced steel like they use for runways. Mm -hmm. And we'd be able to use that for our uh, roofs over our head and then uh, cover it with sandbags. Mm. Uh, in the field, uh, it was, you dug a hole every night, firing position. And uh, that's that was your living quarters. Mm -hmm. you either slept in the hole or slept right on the ground next to the hole, so you could jump in on it if we started taking fire. If you had a camp set up, would you? Would you? Did you get hot showers or MREs? Uh, <clears throat> so the rear area, um, we did have a hot shower because I built it out of uh, some wood that was about. A tore pallets that the ammo came in on and mm -hmm. uh, uh, built it, even found a piece of screen to use it, got a 55-gallon drum uh, and, and put on top, uh, appropriated a shower head from the army who was just across the, on the other side of the camp, uh, who did have hot showers, and uh, also went over and appropriated one of their immersion burners. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. right. And uh, so whoever wanted a, a hot shower had to carry their own water. There was the ladder on the side of the, the shower to dump it in the 55-gallon drum and hmm. uh, dump the uh, kerosene in there to, to light it and uh, keep it hot. That was a, a treat. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, if we were out for an extended period of time, we would uh, bathe in a in bomb crater that was filled with water or um, a stream if we found one. Um, actually, I have some pictures of a bunch of us in the uh, Quaviet River uh, bathing because I was there as a lifeguard. Hmm which did not mean going in after someone who was drowning. It means watching the other side of the river for the bad guys. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you had to be careful bathing uh, because if you were uh, out of the wire because there's leeches everywhere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, they are just, I mean, you can't walk through. I mean, you were, you were cutting leeches off of you every night. So, nasty little things. What about uh, food? Sea rations. Um, and they were terrible. Um, but to make them edible, oh, Louisi yeah. Louisiana type two hot sauce, that's the only thing that would make some of them mm -hmm. palatable. Um, and McElhenney actually produced for us um, what's called the Charlie Ration Cookbook. Hmm. If I can find the opening. And this thing was it, wonderful. It gives you a lot of uh, recipes on what to do. And um, how to make beanies and weenies taste good or the one thing that you could not make taste good was a thing called ham and lima beans. Mm. You open the can and there was seriously a half inch of fat on the top before you ever got to the entree. Um, no one would eat them. Uh, ham and eggs chopped, which was a breakfast uh, came with crackers and grape jelly, and if you dug out the center of the ham and eggs and you put the grape jelly in the hole, uh, heated it up so the grape jelly melted, then you could chop it up and uh, it tasted pretty good that way. Ceasefire casserole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Card relief eggs benedict. <laughs> Rice patty shrimp. Battlefield Foo Foo. Had a lot of protein and a lot of sodium mm -hmm. in all of the, all of them. Uh, the tobacco companies really got guys hooked on cigarettes. Oh yeah. Because in uh, <coughs> every box of C rations you had four cigarettes and uh, camel Lucky Strike, the unfiltered, Marlboros, uh, or Cools. And you know you could get high on the menthol and the Cools. But hmm. I didn't smoke before I went over, but I did start smoking over there mm -hmm. and, and just got hooked on it, as did most of the other guys. The, and that's a you know, hard habit to break once you get back. Yeah. So. With the sea rations, <coughs> I told you nobody liked the ham and lima beans. You know, if we were on patrol and going through a Vietnamese village, the little kids would come out and go, Marine, you number one, you number one. And they're looking for food handouts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, what they really wanted was the pound cake or the um, fruit cocktail. But you toss them a can of ham and lima beans, and they would look at it and shake their heads and throw it back at you and say, Marine, you number 10, you number 10, mm -hmm. like you know, the worst. Um, but we had a good time with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'd give them the little chocolate bars out of the sea rations that you know, uh, things couldn't melt. They were, uh, I think they were part glue. Hmm. Um, uh, our sea rations were left over from the Korean War. And then towards the end of uh, my, my second excursion in Vietnam, uh, we started getting long-range patrol rations, which were the freeze-dried stuff. Mm -hmm. That was pretty good. Uh, had little heat tabs. Um, 
that you know he made a stove out of one of the old sea ration cans and use that to heat your food. Uh, best thing to heat it though was uh, um, C4. Mm -hmm. uh, it burned really hot. Uh, didn't explode, but it burned mm -hmm. really hot. And most of us carried a, a, a block of C4 mm -hmm. as we were going around. You could shoot it and it wouldn't go off. You just needed an electrical detonation to make it go boom. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd use that to blow up tunnels uh, that we found. Or we go through a village and find that they're storing food for the North Vietnamese. Um, we would put C4 down and uh, blow up all the food, make it, make it as hard as possible for the enemy to continue the, the fight. You wouldn't eat their food? Uh, it's mostly rice. Um, and I, I <clears throat> we had in the Marine Corps what was called killer teams. It was a four-man team that would be uh, left on a known infiltration route. So let's say you would go out with your platoon. Uh, they would run a little sweep, and while they were running the sweep, you dug, dug holes uh, for four of you. And you would, you would stay there uh, for a day or two in the hole. But the thing we would do before we, before we would go out is to eat uh, the rice, uh, the nook mom sauce, uh, which is very spicy. You can actually find it on the shelves here in the uh, Vietnamese stores. Uh, it's uh, made with fish heads, and uh, but it came out of your pores, okay? Um, so you smelled the same as the enemy as opposed to uh, farting beanies and weenies when you had, you know, baked beans and mm -hmm. hot dogs or... Uh, you know, you had the same smell, so it was not a giveaway for the guys, uh, the bad guys coming down the trail. Uh, that was interesting times. Hmm. So what was the purpose of the, of the uh, hole? Oh, well, you were hiding, so you'd have uh, a I hole fart. with a, a bush. If you had to take a dump, you took a dump in the hole. Uh, had to take a whiz, you whizzed in the hole. You didn't get out of your hole for two days because uh, you essentially you're hiding for the enemy, looking for them to come down uh, a known infiltration route, their, mm -hmm. their trail. Is it? Are you trying to set up an ambush or? Depends on the number of guys coming down the, the trail. Mm. So if it's one or two, you took them out, uh, checked for if he's carrying messages or any uh, anything that the intelligence guys could use. If it was a big group, which uh, happened to us one evening, uh, 49 guys uh, came down the trail. There were four of us. Uh, we let them go by. Uh, they actually s set up a camp about uh, 100, 200 yards from us. And they sent out, you know, little guys to watch the perimeter. And they cooked their rice and ate. And one guy wandered right back down the trail uh, to take a whiz. And he was looking right at me. Hmm. I mean, I don't know how he did not. Well, I do know how he did see because I was covered in grease paint and brush you know, stuck in my, my helmet. Um, and he took a whiz looking right at me, and he turned around and walked back. And we let him take off and get further down the trail, and then I called in a, a fire mission on him. Hmm. Uh, and then we beat feet to get back to our base camp because mm -hmm. uh, they had to know somebody was out there close enough to see them to call in the fire mm -hmm. mission. So I don't know how many I killed that day, a bunch of them. So. It was a close call. Yeah, there's been some. Yeah. There's some other ones. Um, guy sitting next to me, uh, as we're, well, not sitting, walking next to me as we're going down the, uh, out in the bush. 
one shot kills him, uh, misses me, why did they target him and not me? Um, my radio operator and I always uh, dug a hole together and um, we dug a, a, a grenade dump in the bottom of it so if a grenade landed in the hole we could kick it into the, the dump and then both bail out before it went off. Um, and that happened once when we were in pretty uh, close fighting. A grenade fell in our hole and uh, I looked at it and Herbie, my radio operator, looked at it and I wasn't going to get the medal for him and he wasn't going to get the medal <laughs> for me so we <laughs> both bailed out and it turned out it was a, what we thought was a dud. And the grenades had a wooden handle on it. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the powder and everything was kept up uh, in an iron thing in the front. Um, and they had a pull cord that they pulled to ignite it and then they would throw it. So I said, do you want this thing, a souvenir? He says, no. Nah. He said, I'm not taking that back. You can have it. And I said, I don't want it. So I threw it and it went off. So it was close. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's see, at the start of Tet, um, we, I mean, we got blown up. Uh, and I have a, a picture of an artillery round that hit right at the base of the hooch that I was in and didn't explode. Dud. Uh, so. Uh, why did all that happen? I always I question that. How did I survive a couple of those? Um, we were getting ready to what uh, cross a rice paddy, and there was a tree line on the other side, and so um, we stopped before we went into the, the rice paddy and I called in a fire mission on the tree line on the other side and the rounds hit high enough in the trees that knocked two snipers out. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, they would have, I'm sure, hit a couple of our guys. And the last really close one was when I was riding shotgun for our chaplain uh, to go out to uh, from the, the, the cent central camp in uh, Dong Ha, and he was going out to a couple of the, where the couple of the platoons were set up. Mm -hmm. um, so I just rode shotgun in the back with him with a, a, a machine gun, and I was you know, I was just playing around that you know that'd be a good place for an ambush, or that'd be a good place for an ambush, or somebody should be behind that rock and. There was somebody behind that rock, and I was pointing the machine gun right at him before he even popped up. Uh, so I could have been close. A great chaplain, a uh, Navy chaplain, and uh, he carried a weapon. And I said, Padre, you know, what are you doing carrying a weapon? You're supposed to pray. He said, I've been in three firefights. I prayed all three of them. This time I'm going to shoot back. <laughs> Can't blame him. Nah, great guy. Great hmm. guy. So. What was uh, what was your daily du duty like over there? Um, if we were not on patrol, uh, we were back in the rear area cleaning our weapons, um, relaxing as best we could. Um, I always had uh, night duty in the observation tower uh, to do, um, uh, you know what a uh, night observation device is? You heard of, heard of the starlight scope? A night observation device? Yeah. So it's, it's a really big starlight scope. So uh -huh. you're looking at, instead of looking through a, a, a narrow scope, you're, you're have a much broader picture. Uh -huh. So we had those in the uh, towers 
um, and we would you know, be up there looking around all night to see if anybody was coming. If they were, uh, depending on the size, you called in the alarm, you called in a fire mission. Um, you know, it's been four or five hours up there at night. Then you slept through the day. Mm -hmm. Would you, uh, was it common to take uh, like contact on your on your camp, or was it was it be would they try to re, like avoid? Is there you know a higher population people with dug in positions? Is it so <clears throat> they always knew where our camps were. Okay, there was no no hiding it. You've got three strands of concertina wire around it. You've got a bunch of bunkers, uh, so they could fire at us at will with mortars or rockets or um, and we would we would get that or we would get probes um, they would try to uh, sometimes they would uh, try to overrun us with uh, having sappers come in mm -hmm. with satchel charges and throw it inside the bunkers um, but that that, that happened <clears throat> rarely you see see it more in the movies mm -hmm. uh, they, that happened in real life. Um, but yeah, uh, we'd get uh, harassment fire with um, a mortar from the bush and we'd try to figure out where it was and fire back at it. Uh, if we were out on an overnight uh, patrol or ambush, um, th usually they would walk into it instead of you know, actually knowing we were there before um, they tried shooting at us. Mm -hmm. Or we would walk into one of theirs and uh, they would know where we were and shoot at us. Um, ambush were the toughest. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, guys that walked point with shotguns, you know, they had big brass ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, our canine guy um, uh, walked point a lot with his dog, and the dog would alert, and I never saw him alert incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, I walked uh, with the command group, so the captain or the lieutenant, because uh, they'd tell me what, where they wanted the Mm -hmm. the fireplace and you pretty well had to know where you were uh, looking at the map so you could call in the, the fire. Mm -hmm. um, oh, another really close call. So I, was, I came back off uh, uh, one of the killer teams and just totally beat. You know, Besides my uh, M16, I carried a 45 and a snap draw shoulder holster. Mm -hmm. um, and I just walked into the uh, hooch and I was I beat. We'd been out almost three days. And all I wanted to do was drop my gear and go to sleep. And one of my friends thought he was going to be a smart ass and he jumped on my back and grabbed the 45 and cocked it and stuck it in my chest and I just froze because I hadn't cleared the weapon. Hmm. So you always take the magazine out mm -hmm. and load the, the round in the chamber, and fire the weapon at a bucket of sand to make sure it's clear. Hadn't done that, it was loaded. Hmm. He broke down in tears. He thought it was, I mean, he came close to killing me. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, I almost shot an MP. Uh, I spent the night in the brig. Hmm. <laughs> How'd that happen? So I was escorting a prisoner. Every once in a while, they'd let me out of the field and send me from where we were down to D Da Nang, which was, they had PX, they had hot food, they had hamburgers, um, just kind of like a get out of Dodge for a while. And, the R&R? &R. Yeah. Well, 
you always were doing something, but you had a night that was you could get cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, so I was escorting a prisoner uh, who was going to the brig for trafficking and drugs. Mm. Um, well, that's fine, but you know they don't give you handcuffs in uh, <laughs> in, a, in a combat situation. Mm -hmm. So we were on a helicopter. Uh, I said, hey, what do you do when we, when we get to Da Nang? They said, well, you call the brig, and they'll send transportation for you, and you can take your prisoner to the <clears throat> brig, and then you're done for the night. Great. So we get to the brig, and I, or to Da Nang, I call the brig, I need transportation. We don't provide transportation. I was told you would pick this prisoner up. You bring him here. And I went up to the, up the line to the lieutenant, and he said, "No, we just don't have the resource, you know, the, the time or people to come do that. Here's what you do: you hop a truck going out to Dog Patch. Dog Patch is a little area just outside of Da Nang that has anything you wanted to, that you weren't supposed to have." Yeah. Um, and they said there would be you know, an MP there directing traffic. Uh, you hop off at Dog Patch and tell the MP you want to ride out to the brig and he'll flag down a truck going our way. Great. So we get to Dog Patch, no problem. Uh, I mean, it was heavy, heavy traffic. And I'm yelling at the MP and he can't hear me because of the trucks going by. So. I wasn't going to drag my prisoner out in the middle of the, the, the traffic, so I stuck him on the, the curb. I mean, it's Vietnam, where's he going to go? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I go out and talk to the MP. I said, I need you know, transportation for my prisoner, and I pointed over at my prisoner. Um, and he's heading into one of the hooches with one of the little uh, prostitutes. Hmm. Uh, I said, well, if he's flagged the truck down, I'll, I'll go get him and we'll be back. So I go in to get him, and he's already got his trousers dropped. And I grab him by the back of the neck and pulling him up. And in from the other door comes a guy uh, who was dark-skinned. It turns out he was Hispanic, but he started to draw his 45 and he just the reaction mine was right here and it's so fast getting out and I had it stuck in his face before he even got the flap on his hmm. holster um, and then I see the armband MP hmm. I go oh shit um, so anyway I tried to explain what had happened and Everything probably would have been okay if he hadn't wet his pants. Hmm. But um, so we both got a ride to the brig. I spent one night and got didn't get my shower, didn't get my hamburger. Hmm. Uh, caught a chopper back the next day and <clears throat> had battalion office hours for it, which is uh, it's lower than a court martial. You know you're up in front mm -hmm. of the colonel to figure out uh, what punishment you're going to get. So I explained the situation to him, and he said, Damn it, Dusty, what am I going to do with you? Um, oh, that was my nickname. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I don't know, sir. What, what do you want, 100 push-ups? He said, No. He says, I'm going to hold up your promotion for a week. So that was my punishment. Hmm. Hmm. Could have been worse. Could have been worse. Could have been a lot worse if I pulled the trigger. Yeah. For both of us. Yeah, then you would have had to kill the witness. Yeah. <laughs> both of them. Yeah. <laughs> so you never really got R&R, &R, you just get like some Oh, I did get R&R. &R. Oh, did you? Yeah, so... Um, I went to Kuala Lumpur, really interesting, um, just from the, the city, beautiful city, um, and uh, 
be honest, I really didn't do bar grills, but I was in a um, in a bar and they had a, this beautiful singer, uh, and I talked to the madam and she kept trying, no, 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 she doesn't do that. I said, I I don't want to take her back to the hotel. Mm -hmm. you know, I just like to talk to her. I mean, she's had beautiful English and uh, was really lovely. Um, so we got to be good friends. Turns out she was the daughter of one of the ranking officers in the um, Malaysian Army. Hmm. Um, so, well, I mean, we became friends and was there for four days, I think. Uh, got to see all the sights. Um, got to go swimming in a private pool uh, at their house. Um, And then I was going to go on R and R to Australia. I really wanted to go to Australia, and I was on the plane, but I was the last one on. So the loadmaster comes on and tells me, "Sorry, Sarge, you're getting bumped." Oh, so I got bumped for a lieutenant. Of course. Of course. Uh, and worse, worse than that, he was a butter bar. Um, I, a second lieutenant, mm -hmm. only been in country for a while, and I'd already been there over a year. So uh, my next choice was Hawaii, you know, where everyone spoke English. Get on the plane. I was last on because I was standby. I got bumped. Hmm by another officer. So I said, okay, you know, I've already spent now eight hours waiting for flights. And I talked to the loadmaster. I said, what's the next next thing out? He said, it's going to Taiwan. I said, sounds great. Put me on it. So I got on there and um, perfect ending. He comes on tells me I'm getting bumped again. I said, this is the third time. And the flight attendant said, what do you mean he's getting bumped? And he said, oh, I had to bump him off Australia. I had to bump him off Hawaii. Um, and somebody needs his seat. And she says, well, you're not bumping him off this flight. And I said, you come with me. So I sat in the jump seat with flight attendants. Nice. And every Marine on that plane is just glaring at me. <laughs> so they adopted me. Okay, so we get off the, the flight and uh, the, the flight officers and all the flight attendants kind of adopted me. We went out to dinner together. We went to the officers club together. I wasn't an officer. I felt really out of place. And they mm -hmm. said, relax, nobody's going to check your, you know, you're wearing civilian clothes. Nobody's going to check who you are. Um, just treated me like uh, royalty. Uh, it was it was a wonderful experience, um, uh, and one of the flight attendants was uh, really really nice. Hmm. So, uh, that's pretty much my experiences with R and R. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like a pretty good experience in the long run. Well, yeah, the last one was. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you tore into the Nam, and it sounds like you got married pretty quickly after that. Yeah, uh, stupidly. You mm -hmm. know. Hadn't seen a round eye in <laughs> a couple years. and you know. uh, We had uh, traded letters. Uh, I met her through a friend, uh, one of the other sergeants over there, <clears throat> who was engaged to three ladies, hmm. um, and he had a, a, a book, a picture album of all the girls he was writing to. Uh, he said, pick one. So I just picked a random picture. Um, and we wrote for nine, ten months. Mm -hmm. You know, feel like you get to know people through their 
letters, you don't. Hmm. But um, met her as soon as I got back, fell in love, sort of, and uh, we got married within a month. Uh, married for seven years, had a son, uh, got divorced. Uh, I had a job that had me on the road all the time, and she didn't like being alone. Happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, not close to my son. Um, got remarried. Have two wonderful daughters, uh, three grandkids, to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Oh, yeah, wonderful. And she takes good care of me because I don't get around well. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of limitations now. Not what we plan to spend our, uh, our retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, she retired after 20 years from Blue Valley Northwest. Oh, nice. And, uh, my last job, first 11 years before retiring, was with Cerner. Mm -hmm. So, I think everybody works for Cerner if you stay, stick around here long enough. Yeah, Cerner or Hallmark or Sprint. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. or now soon to be T-Mobile. Well, I'd say 40 years you put your time in, you know. Oh, yeah. So, although I was, by her grandma's standard, a part-time husband because um, as a consultant or IT guy mm -hmm. or sales guy, I was on the road Monday through Thursday. Um, kind of self-taught. Uh, got back from Nam, I went to work, uh, got out, went to work for uh, State Farm Insurance in their IT shop. I had no IT experience. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, got programmer, analyst, um, I uh, went to Illinois State after I got out, um, took a couple computer courses, uh, assembler language, COBOL. And that was back when COBOL was just starting up. Mm -hmm. We don't, no one programs COBOL anymore. You're right. Um, but State Farm had a COBOL compiler, and you were graded on how many times it took you to, at, at college, to get your program to run correctly. Well, uh, I would debug it on the State Farm computer, mm. and it was perfect every time that I ran it on the mm. uh, Illinois State's uh, computer. So I aced that course. Uh, the professor asked me if I'd like to help teach. <laughs> I said, no. Mm. <laughs> but it was a good intro into uh, IT shop. Mm -hmm. and, it's a pretty good school. Yeah. yeah. Did you finish your degree there or did you just move on? No, I still have 32 hours left. Plan on knocking those out anytime soon? Absolutely not. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the, uh, it has never hurt me in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was, VP at Cerner. I was VP of a con uh, consulting company out of Chicago. Uh, I was a nationwide consultant for shared medical systems. It's now Siemens. Uh, I was sent to Japan and the UK by SMS to mm -hmm. help get their systems off the ground and installed. So, yeah. Is. Haven't missed those 32 hours. So when, d during your time at State Farm, did you ever meet Jake? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never did. Um, I did play tennis with Ed Rust, who was the CEO of State Farm. Uh, we didn't live too far apart. And we're at the same tennis club. But uh, Jake wasn't around then. But I'm sure he was wearing khakis and a red shirt. Mm -hmm. um, 
When you were in Nam, did you communicate much with back home? Or I, I know you were you were writing letters to the, what became your future ex-wife. Yeah. Um, communicated with my dad all the time. Uh, actually got a letter from our minister telling me not to be so graphic in my letters. Hmm. Um, and that maybe I shouldn't do the uh, the the tapes because we sent tapes back mm -hmm. and forth for a while, uh, and those were great. And uh, there was one evening I was recording a letter to my dad, and uh, we started taking incoming, uh, but it wasn't like near me, so I just kept on talking mm -hmm. uh, and didn't think a, a a thing about it. I mean, it was just that was daily occurrence, of, right? And so I sent the tape off, and then I got another letter from the minister because my dad was just torn up about it because um, uh, you could hear the rounds going off right mm -hmm. behind me, and you know, and then I'm just you know even, or I may have said something. Well, maybe I should go in the bunker or something like that. But I, I don't remember. I only remember that he got really really mm -hmm. upset about it enough to go talk to his minister about it. Um, when I got back from Nam and um, had orders to embassy duty, but chose to get married, so that eliminated going to embassy duty. So they sent me to Columbus, Ohio, um, to the Marine Corps Re Reserve Unit there, and uh, to train the guys, they drilled every other weekend. Um, two week summer camp, we went to Camp Lejeune and they got to play war games down there. Um, and then we had a, a military reserve, uh, not you know, maybe an hour from us that we would go on weekends and tramp around out there. Uh, I set up a, a map, map and compass course. That was my specialty. Mm -hmm. um, it took me 35, 40 minutes to set it up. I figured they could run it in two hours. Uh, we started at 5 o'clock. Uh, it was starting to get dark by 9, and there were still guys out there. Lieutenants. Oh, they were just, I mean... <laughs> This is probably hey, some, they were lost. Probably some lieutenants still yeah. out there, right? So uh, <laughs> there were some guys in the unit that had been in Vietnam, so I, I picked five guys and, and myself. And uh, we had blank firing adapters on our weapons. You know what that does? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we would uh, we went out and set up an ambush for them because you could tell where they were because they were laughing and joking and. Uh, smoking and just goofing off that it was getting dark and time to go and we set up a, a an L-shaped ambush and the uh, guys walked right into it and we opened up full automatic uh, obviously blanks mm -hmm. and guys were falling all over themselves or dirtying their pants mm -hmm. or I mean it was nobody wanted to ride with them on the way back mm -hmm. so, um, so that was fun. Um, we caught a couple of kids in a um, car. Uh, this is a military reservation, as it's called, and uh, they were uh, busy in the back seat of the car. And of course, we walked up, and we're all grease painted up and have flashlights and shine the flashlight in. And the guy didn't notice, the girl did. She screamed. Mm. Uh, he jumps up, obviously, and uh, she literally passed out. Oh, she wow. was so scared she just, or she faked it well. And uh, the guys were going, next, second. And, you know, obviously, they're just bullshitting, but. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the guy was, I mean, he was so scared. He was trembling, trembling mm -hmm. and uh, 
So get in the car and get out of here. And you're not where you're supposed to be. I'll bet she'd never got in the back seat of a car again. <laughs> And then our duties were uh, there. Um, there were five guys that were active duty Marines that were assigned there. Um, uh, a major, a first sergeant, um, a staff sergeant, uh, me as a E5 sergeant, uh, a lance corporal. Yeah, and so we uh, ran the the shop. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have to stand fire watch. Uh, well, the officers didn't, but all the enlisted stood fire watch uh, one night a week. Uh, answered the phone uh, if there were ca uh, casualties from the central Ohio area. Uh, we would have to go out and notify the family, uh, if it was uh, KIA, uh, the officer went, if it was uh, just wounded, to, uh, mm -hmm. any of the enlisted could go. Well, okay, sergeant and above, Lance Corporal never had to go out. Um, we had to make the funerals, doing the dress blues. Uh, I really screwed one up because uh, I was the armorer mm -hmm. and we had the nephew of Rosemary Wood. Do you remember that name? Mm -mm. Remember the missing 18 minutes of tape from Nixon? Oh, yeah. Rosemary Wood's mm -hmm. nephew uh, was killed in Nam. Um, he was a Marine. Uh, so uh, the major said, I want you to get the prettiest and the best rifles you got and, da, 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 and clean them all up and make sure they're, they're perfect for this. I did, you know, and I'd painted the blank firing adapters black so they blended in and so we didn't have to crank the, the slide on the M14. Mm -hmm. um, so we went out and we were doing the 21 gun salute and uh, everything went perfectly except I picked an automatic weapon. <laughs> uh, it was one of the prettiest ones we had in the bunch, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the guy with the weapon fired and he pulled the trigger and after he had flipped the switch, he, instead of going single, it went automatic and uh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know. <laughs> well, at least he was smart enough that he kept bringing the weapon up and pretending like he was firing. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, but the first burst he hit the it. First he? burst was <laughs> ugly, and uh, so uh, actually, uh, uh, Rosemary came up to me afterwards and said, "You know, Sergeant, I've been to a few of these around D.C." Guys got your act together with after that first burst, but that was terrible. <laughs> yeah, I was embarrassed. As, I didn't tell her what had happened, but I was uh, so embarrassed about that. You said I'll have to talk to my lance corporal about that. He must. Yeah, he must have done something wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> had some interesting funerals. Um, one was. Um, country western theme, uh, guitar, country western music through the whole thing. Um, uh, I, I mean, it, it was wild. Mm -hmm. uh, made a casualty call with the major on a, a guy that was killed. Uh, it was at the university and uh, knocked on the door of the the dorm and uh, told the girl that you know her boyfriend or fiance had been killed over there he had her mm -hmm. down as you know who to notify and her first question was well when do I get the check and ten thousand dollar death benefit hmm. her first question 
not like, oh, no, no. Yeah, no. Um, if, if the person was elderly, we would try to get a neighbor to go with us or if we could find the, the minister or whatever, mm -hmm. we would do that. We did have one occasion where uh, the kid had been living with his grandmother or she had raised him and she had a heart attack when we told her. Um, and that was, I mean, uh, telling the parents was actually harder than telling the wives. Yeah. yeah they were, um, yeah. I so, bet. Yeah. Be a tough duty. It was not my favorite. Yeah. My addiction is Diet <laughs> Pepsi. How do you think being a Marine and or you know, just the combat veteran in general, well, specifically Marine, uh, impacted the rest of your life? Um, <laughs> probably looking at things a little differently when um, people are going, you know, something happens, oh, this is terrible. I, 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 I can't deal with this, this is terrible. And I'm going, why? Your dishwasher's broken, you're, you know, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Or uh, my car broke down, I'm stuck. Mm, yeah, it's, it, it's not, I mean, you look at it after being in combat and especially some of the really crappy situations we were in there. Some of this little stuff is, uh, you know, you don't understand how people can be so upset about it. And uh, my wife has commented that, you know, you're always calm in bad situations. I said, because they're not that bad. You know, I mean, I'm not going to die because the car's broken down or I'm not, you know, look mm -hmm. at it differently. Um, I've had a, uh, I've only had the amputation three years. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got my knee torn up and numb. Um, uh, I got medevaced. I spent three days or three nights in the hospital having the sink packed in ice and uh, 30 cc's of fluid drained out of it for three days straight. Um, got sent back to the field, you know, limped around for a while. Um, so it had been hurting uh, since 1968. Mm -hmm. um, before the amputation, I'd had 16 surgeries on the knee. Mm. Um, it had been hurting since 1968. Mm -hmm. You deal with the pain. Uh, I think that's one of the things that the Marine Corps instills in you is you don't give up the pain. You don't quit because you're in pain. You just deal with it and move on and you find a way to adapt to the pain and you just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, the physical therapist that after the, I got the prosthetic that I worked with um, said, you know, you're an old guy. Why do you drive yourself like this? Most guys would not be pushing themselves to, to do this. I said, you know, you, 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 a Marine Corps model, adapt and overcome. I mean, you can't let this get you down. Uh, I don't play golf the way I used to. I used to be a seven handicap. Now I'm lucky to hit the ball 150 yards, but I'm still out trying to hit the ball. Mm -hmm. um, so this was amputated because of um, knee replacements and infections from the knee replacements. Um, the first one had MRSA. Mm. Mm. Uh, 
uh, so I had a pick line. I went to infusion therapy for six months every day. Um, they took that out, put an antibiotic spacer in, put the new knee in. Um, that one developed E. coli. Somebody didn't wash their hands. They took that out, cleaned it, put it back in. That one had three bugs that they couldn't kill. It uh, got into the uh, the bone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had dropped down to 145 pounds just from the infection. Ah. So it was pretty much a choice of you're going to chop it or you're going to die. So mm -hmm. we chopped it. But that's where the cane comes in. Hmm. So, um, you look at the little nice so my friends um, yeah there's no flask or sword yeah <laughs> well, there's a nice little USMC around the handle with the uh, Marine Corps emblem yeah it's really nice so You're my friends um, <clears throat> it's uh, I'm Catholic uh, that we'd have a group of guys that get together every Wednesday and Friday mornings for mass, and then we go to breakfast over mm -hmm. High V. So the uh, two days before I was going to get chopped, um, they had a going away party for my leg hmm. with a cake, <laughs> and they had a priest. So. The cake was, they told the, the cake decorator they wanted to say Psalm 23, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Um, she didn't know how to spell Psalm, so she just put S A L M. <laughs> um, so they had her, they got the cake and they had her put the P on it, but the P was down on the side of the cake. So. And then they had a, the, the priest, we went over to the church, and he did the anointing of the sick because, you know, that time I was really, really sick. Mm. Um, and they got me the cane. Mm -hmm. so. that's, that's one of those situations in the South, they just say, bless her heart. Yeah. Bless her heart. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, funny. Yeah. So anyway, I'm learning how to walk. Yeah. Well, I mean... You're still swinging a golf club, so yeah, it's not all bad. Still able to play with the grandkids. Yeah, that's what matters. You know, you look at every day, like, you know, um, I've been to the wall twice. Mm -hmm. uh, it tears me up. I mean, it just really breaks me up. It's daunting. Uh, I mean, um, and you know you you lose the names after a while. Mm -hmm. There are six names on the wall that I should have been the seventh. We were playing poker in a hooch, um, and I had to go on uh, on duty. Uh, and about 15 minutes later, uh, it took one incoming rocket into our camp in that hooch. It killed the six guys that I'd been playing poker with within 15 minutes after me leaving. Uh, still think about that. Yeah. Then my radio operator got high one night. We were out on a two-man listening post. We were probably a couple hundred yards away from the perimeter. And I taught him how to call fire missions just in case I ever got dinged. He could continue. I mean, he could read the map almost as well as I could. Um, he started calling in a fire mission, uh, and it was all white phosphorus. And finally, he kicked my boot and said, hey, they want to talk to you. And I said, who? Uh, so 
hand me the headset. I said, they do. So I said, yeah. My call sign was Whiskey India, and I was Whiskey India Actual. Um, so I said, Whiskey India Actual. And he said, are you sure you want this next round? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you were calling in a fire mission. I said, well, cancel it. And then I said, where was that round going to land? She said, well, according to where we've got you plotted, it was going to land right on top of you. And I kicked Herbie in the butt, literally, and I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, man. He said, that was so pretty. Watching the rounds go off in the rice paddy. Hmm. You know, Willie Peter, and it was, uh, he was getting a charge out of it. You know. <laughs> so he got high and about put one in your lap, huh? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Herbie was a good guy. <laughs> so he and I, uh, his real name was Warren W. Wallace mm -hmm. III, a uh, black kid from Chicago. And uh, lost touch with him after you know I came back. He had another couple months to go. But we always called him uh, one-way Herbie mm -hmm. because if a care package came in and it was his, it only went one way. Oh, I did get to see one USO show. It, oh, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't anybody famous, mm -hmm. but it was a, a husband and wife that um, performed um, Shelley's War. I mean, the one time I saw it. Uh, sparkly stuff and uh, you know short skirt or I think it was hot pants mm -hmm. oh it was because she took her skirt off and underneath was hot pants and everybody went wild when she took her skirt off so she called me up on stage I was fortunate enough and sat in my lap and you know everybody's going crazy down there and um, and she says, she whispers, okay, I wanna, want you to unhook the bra. Uh, well, she's wearing two, okay, the one, the show bra, mm -hmm. right, and then she's got another one underneath. So I said, sure. And, uh, so I did, both of them at the same time. And there, and she's, uh, you know, and the guys went went berserk. Her husband cracked up. I mean, he lost control of the guitar he was playing, and he mm -hmm. just cracking up. And she was covering up and running behind the the speakers and whatever. So I'm there holding up the bras, and uh, the hit for the day. Hmm. Your 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was back in Dong Ha. Mm -hmm. uh, we got hit real hard in Tet. Uh, that's where the uh, the round hit at the base of my hooch and didn't mm. explode. Uh, what, what year was that? 68. 68. Was that the big one? Yeah, oh, that was the yeah. big one. Yeah. Because they, they kind of attacked every year on that same time, right? Oh, they, yeah. 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 But 68 uh, was the big one? Yeah. Um, I never <laughs> made it to Way. Um, that's where uh, essentially they surrounded the town, mm -hmm. the street fighting. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that looked like my boot camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and that was, uh, he, the, the sergeant was a, actually the, a real drill instructor, Marine Corps sergeant mm -hmm. that played in that. Arlie Ermley? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we had a guy point of 45 at the uh, 45 instructor, and he did the run around the platoon as they were going back. And mm -hmm. um, they had him in the pit until he barked like a dog. I mean, he was just, it, it happened. Mm -hmm. But we never had anybody <coughs> drill, drill instructor. And there's a book I would recommend. Uh, it's called Matterhorn uh, by Carl.
Carl Barlantis. Mm -hmm. He was an officer in our uh, battalion. Oh, really? Yeah. And I can identify with everything that happened in his book. It's fiction, um, except two things. Right? None of our officers ever got fragged. And as far as I know, none of the grunts ever got a, a leech up their penis. Hmm. Other than that, everything else in there easily identifiable as mm -hmm. stuff that happened to us. So he was really, really talented writer. Uh, oh, you want to see any pictures? Yeah, let's check them out. Okay. Uh, relaxing out in the bush for the night, uh, mm -hmm. sitting on a box of ammo with my stove sitting on the box of ammo. And here's my friend. Uh, His name was Dog. Dog? Mm-hmm. Well, he's a little one, because that's the canteen next to him. That is a canteen, and this is just after he ate, because he ate out of a sea mm. ration can. Mm. 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 He's a cute little fella. Yeah. This is the hooch I was telling you about that got hit just after I left. Oh, yeah. This is after it was hit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's Tet, and then blowing, North Vietnamese is blowing up everything. And this is, so this is 68? Yeah. Mm hmm Here's our bathtub where I was lifeguard. Mm hmm. Hmm. And this is the round that hit at the base of my bunker. I didn't realize at first you guys are naked in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, well, I had to get clean. Yeah. Vietnam conflict map. Oh, wow. So we were right there. That was our mm -hmm. area of operations. I see. So we have. You pointed it again. Uh, we find it exactly. There's the pink is North Vietnam. Way is right there. That was the biggest part of uh, what you hear about in the, uh, the uh, and then uh, Da Nang right here, which is our very, very rear area. But Quang Tri Province um, was where a lot of the action took place. And Qu we were in Quang Tri. Quezon is right here. Kantian, Jialin, and then we had separate camps right all along the, the DMZ there. Wow. And this is that your dad kept this? Yeah. While you were over there? Yeah, so he can figure out where I was. When you were like reading your letters, when you were talking yeah. about places? That's really cool. And then right in the middle of the Ben High River mm -hmm. was a North, North Vietnamese uh, garrison flag. Mm -hmm. This thing is huge. And it was on a flagpole right in the middle of the river. Wow. And we used to have target practice at it. Hmm. And, you know, you didn't want to waste rounds, so you called like suspected troop movement or 
troops in the open, mm -hmm. or we hear trucks or tanks, so you'd get uh, somebody to shoot at you, try to knock it down, yeah. essentially. So I got to fire three rounds once, and they gave me a call sign that I'd never heard before. Uh, and usually it was the 175s or the 8-inchers behind us. Mm -hmm. And when you call the 8-inchers, those things move so slow you could actually track them as they went over your head towards the target. Wow. So, so I got three rounds. I was told to bracket it. So one went long, one went short, one hit kind of right at the base, and the, the flag went. Hmm. It, it never went fully down, mm -hmm. but that was all I got to shoot. found out later I was shooting a battleship. Oh, really? Yeah. So I was, wow. fi I was firing essentially the cost of a Volkswagen at that time uh -huh. every time they pulled the trigger. And uh, the next morning, the flagpole was straight back up again. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but it was target practice. Yeah. yeah. Expensive target practice. <laughs> yeah. Those kept bombs are even more expensive. Kept people on their toes. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, we were in a, a movement, and we trapped some North Vietnamese trying to get back across uh, the DMZ. Mm -hmm. um, so I would drop mortars to keep them from going straight north, so they had to go across our uh, our path, so to speak, and our sniper was taking target practice at them as they were. So they'd stick their heads out and they'd get ready to run, and I'd drop mortars so they couldn't go that way, and they'd go straight across, and it was like shooting ducks in a you know, <laughs> carnival. Mm -hmm. um, and then they called up. Uh, uh, a mule with the 105 recoilless on it, and they were fl firing flechette rounds at him as they tried to go north. I mean, we probably wiped out a platoon of them trying to escape. Uh, still remember the lieutenant saying, This is better than sex. <laughs> and I said, LT, who have you been having sex with? That's not <laughs> quite how I put it, but, you know. <laughs> so. Well, he's just a, just a young butter bar, I mean. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the <clears throat> young lieutenants that did the best listened to the sergeants because mm -hmm. uh, we could, you know, if somebody's been there six months, they kind of know what they're doing. If they get past six months, they're probably going to be okay. It's the young guys that come along that you know, don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, or they'll step into a punchy pit or you know, nasty mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, Uh, booby traps, uh, uh, little snakes that they would stuff down into a piece of bamboo and cork them in and, uh, you know, head down and they, if you tripped the wire, the, they would let them out and they'd be kind of nasty. Mm -hmm. uh, little bamboo vi vipers, little green things that were nasty. Uh, we did have, uh, I guess it was a boa constrictor that got into our perimeter. And you know what good shots Marines are, right? Mm. And they fired fully automatic, 20 rounds a piece, three guys. The thing stopped. I, I walked over to it. They'd hit it three times. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, it wrapped itself around my legs. And uh, so I uh, discouraged it with the 45 to the head. It turns out it was a little guy. That it was like six feet. There's no way it could, would hurt, hurt a human. Mm -hmm. um, but we ate it. 
Uh, it tastes like chicken. Hmm. Uh, everything tasted like chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, you, well, you didn't even probably didn't remember what chicken tasted like anymore. No, no, because you know I, I don't think there was any chicken in the sea rations. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a lot of ham, uh, pork and beans, uh, turkey loaf. That was kind of disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> you have any any last any last uh, hail marys for today? Uh, speaking of that, came up the other night because we have a small faith group for Lent, and we were talking about angels, and I actually saw one when I was in um, uh, on an LP with Herbie. He was sound asleep. I'm sitting there, lonesome as hell, uh, tired mad at myself, mad at the world, and my mother appeared. Okay. Uh, I'm 21 years old. My mother died when I was five. I never carried a picture of her. Have very few pictures of her. But she was there, not for long, maybe a minute, I didn't say anything. She didn't say anything. They just we just looked at one another. Um, very weird experience. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the Hail Mary. Yeah, definitely was. Although her name was Beulah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's probably just what you needed at the time. It was. It was. You know, I kind of felt like everything's okay. So. Yeah. Well, sir, I want to say uh, thank you for coming. You had oh. Some uh, incredible experiences, to say the least. Yeah. And uh, truly, truly honored to have you share those with us. So thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. It was 